okay? Isaiah chapter, <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 9. Um, we're going to step out of 1 Corinthians here for a couple weeks, and you'll, you'll, you'll hear why. In the fall, heading into winter of 1517, the great reformer Martin Luther called the Catholic Church to a debate. And he did it for a reason, because Luther's concern was the people were walking in spiritual darkness because the Catholic Church had added good works to the gospel of free grace. And so Luther called them to a debate. And Luther's plea, which eventually down the road a few, a few years later, became known as what we call the Great Reformation. And as the Great Reformation swept through Europe, the idea and the theology behind the gospel of grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone, captured the hearts of people all over Europe. And it was during that time that the, as, of the, as the light of the gospel began to sweep through Europe, the great reformers came up with a Latin phrase that they talked about during this time. And here was the phrase, post tenebrac pros lux, which means after darkness, light. And in my opinion, there could not be a better theme for Christmas. After darkness, light. I know this may surprise some of you, but um, if you think about the southern hemisphere of our world, I have some friends that live in Sydney, Australia, and a buddy of mine recently was telling me, I said, hey, what's it like in Sydney during Christmas time? He said, it's really weird. He says, uh, he's from Wales, originally from Wales. He said, it's really weird because um, it's in summertime. It's the hottest time of the year. He said, and we would, whenever the malls were open, we go walking through the malls and they're singing, uh, walking in a winter wonderland and we're wearing tank tops and shorts. I mean, it's a weird thing to think about because in our world, the northern hemisphere side, everything is in the coldest, darkest season of the year. And it's in this time of the year that we talk about the light of Christ coming in the darkness of winter. And perhaps there's no better word for us to hear during this year of 2020. Because for many of us, 2020 has been the darkest year of many of our lives. Listen, if you're, if you're younger than 50, younger than 50, you didn't experience Vietnam War, you didn't experience uh, the decadence of the 60s, you might not have talked to anybody who was in the greatest generation that lived through World War II. This year, 2020, would be the darkest year of your life. It's been one of the hardest years of our lives. A global pandemic, life shut down as we know it, a presidential election that has divided our nation, racial tensions all, ab all around us, cities ablaze, and an uncertain economic future has caused 2020 to really feel like the dark ages. And it's with that darkness in mind that I actually think, looking back to last November, when we begin to plan a Christmas series, that I think the Lord was providentially kind to us to get us to this point. So that darkness in mind, I want us to look at the light and hope of Christmas. So the next four sermons, today's sermon, next Sunday sermon, Christmas Eve sermon, and the December 27th sermon are all part of the Christmas series. And what we're going to do in this series is talk about Old Testament prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. And here's what I want to look at. Here's what the hope is of this series. Is if you've got your outline, you can pull it out. This is the big idea. Because Christ has come, Christians can have hope in this world. Because Christ has come, Christians can have hope in this world. Very simple, very straightforward. And I want you to understand why we need this now. Lasting hope is not found in a vaccine. I want everybody to hear that. No matter where you land on if you're going to get it or not, it's not found in a vaccine. Lasting hope is not found in the president of your voting landing in the White House. No matter which side of the aisle you land on, lasting hope is not found in your business now or in the future doing well or not doing well, no matter which business you are in. For the Christian, because Christ has come, we of all people, all people in this world, have reason to have hope. That's why I am deeply concerned about the way Christians are acting during this season with the grumbling, complaining, and griping all the time without the hope that should be landing in our hearts 
about the hope of Christ. Because Christ has come, we as Christians can have hope in this world now. That's what we're going to see all of December. So let's stand together and let's read Isaiah 9, verses 1 through 7. This is the reading of God's Word. But there, was, but there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden, the rod of his, and the staff of his, for his shoulder, and the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in, a, in battle tumult, and every garment rolled up in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with righteousness and with justice from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Let's pray. Father, your word is clear that when your word is preached, you accomplish everything you send it out to do in the hearts of your people. And Lord, this morning, each of us need this word of hope from you. Whether that be the discouraged housewife, whether it be the troubled concrete uh, Mason, whether it be the logger who is wondering what his job's going to look like, whether it be the lady going to do work at, as, a, as a nurse at the hospital wondering what she's going to face today. We need to hear the word of the risen Christ once again. So Father, would you go to work in each heart and give us eyes of faith to see that which is unseen. And give us hope of a future that's certain. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. You can see why, in reading the text, because Christ has come, we as Christians can have hope in this world. The prophet Isaiah served in the nation of Israel for about 40 years, from 740 B.C. to 700 B.C., and it was during some of the most turbulent times of Israel's history. The people were hard-hearted, they were stubborn, and they were deaf to God's Word. And because of their sin, the Lord brought enemies from Assyria and Babylon to destroy their heritage, their nation, their, the, their capital city of Jerusalem, and, and ransack the temple of the Holy God. It was during this time that the Lord called Isaiah, the son of a nobleman, to leave his prosperity and his wealth behind and to speak God's word to the people. Even though these people would not hear him, they would be deaf and stubborn as God had already told him, Isaiah was captured by a vision of the holy God. You can read about that vision in Isaiah chapter 6. And his vision throughout the rest of the book, consists of warnings to the nation of what is coming upon them because of their unrepentant sin. In chapter 7 and 8, Isaiah warns them about the coming invasion of the Assyrians. It's almost like if you read the pages, it's almost like Isaiah, having this prophetic vision, sees this darkness glooming over the land, much like Gandalf did as he saw the War of the Ring coming upon the nation of men during the, during the third age of the Lord of the Rings. It's in the midst of that darkness, that deep, dark 
darkness hanging over the nation that Isaiah chapter 9 is written. Now see, we, we read this text during Christmas season. It's the most happiest time of the year. They would not be singing that song as they're reading Isaiah 9. Assyria is on the doorstep. Destruction is coming. Fear is filling the city streets. The enemy is preparing for war and clanging their swords to their shield. That, that is what is happening in the backdrop of Isaiah chapter 9. And so let's look at our first point in your outline, which what, do, what, is, what does hope look like? Because it's in the middle of that, that destruction, that, I, that prophecy of destruction, that Isaiah gives him a prophecy of hope. What does hope look like? I mean, I don't, I don't know about you, I, I've not been in war. I've not been in chaos of such catastrophe coming that we could feel the tension and the fear that the nation of Israel probably felt. The last verse of Isaiah 8 really lays out the problem. Notice how Isaiah put this in Isaiah verse 22. And they will look to the earth, but behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. I mean, look at these words, gloom of anguish, distress, thick darkness. In the midst of this prophecy of darkness, Isaiah has a vision of hope, of something that's coming. And notice throughout Isaiah 9, the transitions that he talks about. You go from one to another. Notice in verse 1, he talks about going from gloom to glory. Isaiah names these northern tribes. Zebulun and Naphtali. Now if you understand what's happening geographically here, this part of Israel is a northern part of Israel, and they are on the border of all the Gentile lands. It's that area that the Assyrians are going to run over first. And he tells them in 822 that gloom is coming, but in verse 1 he says, but there will be no gloom for you in your anguish. Once brought into contempt, but in the latter time, it will be glorious. They go from glory to gloom. But notice verse 2 says, they'll go from darkness to light. Though they walked in darkness, they will see a great light. Though they dwelt in thick darkness, a light has shone on them. And notice in verse 3 that he says, they'll go from sorrow to great joy. He gives us two examples of joy. Joy like at the harvest. It's a moment when people had been working all year long to get a harvest. Their cupboards are bare. They go to reap what's in the harvest, and they fill up their cupboard looking ahead to all the plenty that they have from that harvest. But he also says it's like a former victory, a victory like in the days of Midian. Now, you might know this if you know your Bibles very well. In the book of Judges, there was a guy named Gideon. When the Midianites came in, thousands of them upon thousands And God took Gideon and his little army of 300 men and told them to do a couple things. Blow some trumpets and wave some torches as you surround the thousands of Midianites. And as they did that, the Midianites literally jumped up out of their beds and started killing one another. In other words, what he's saying is, not only does God give us joy in in the harvest, it's a victory over a gigantic enemy done miraculously. And the victory is so complete that he says, you'll take your enemy's garments, you'll roll them up, and you'll use them for fuel for your fire. In other words, the victory is so complete that the enemy becomes the one who is serving you. The oppressor becomes the servant. And his point throughout the text is, what, what does hope look like? It looks like from gloom to glory, from darkness to light, from sorrow to joy, from oppression to victory. But notice something else in these verses that I think we have to pay attention to. Notice first that these are all things that God does. Verse 1, he made glorious the way of the sea. Verse 2, the implication is the Lord opened the eyes to see the light. Verse 3, you the Lord have multiplied the nation. You the Lord have increased its joy. They rejoice before you who's the Lord. 
Verse 4, you, the Lord, have broken the yoke, the staff, and the rod of the oppressor. I'm indicating something remarkable. In, in Isaiah's vision of hope, it all stems around God's work. God's work brings the hope. Without God's work, there is no hope. If God does not go to work, there's no hope. But because God is working, there is hope. But notice something second in this, and you'll notice this. Those of you that are grammar nuts, you'll get where I'm coming from in this. Notice that all these things are mentioned either in the past tense or the present tense. Now again, let's think about what's happening here. Assyria's waiting at the gates. And notice how Isaiah puts this vision. Verse 1, has made glorious. Verse 2, have seen a great light. Light has shone. Verse 3, multiplied, increased. They rejoice before you. They are glad. Verse 4, you have broken. Now what is Isaiah doing here? These things are not currently happening in Isaiah's time. Here's what's happening is Isaiah is seeing a future event in present tense as if it happened. In other words, this is what hope looks like. Hope sees all that God has promised in the past tense as a present reality as if it's as good as done. It's as if it's a certain reality. It, it, it's, a, it's the past tense of a future certainty. Alex Mortier put it this way, Isaiah insists here that hope is a present reality, part of the constitution of the now. The darkness is true, but it's not the whole truth, and certainly not the fundamental truth. Now just for a moment, Again, think how remarkable this is. Assyria, the foremost army of the day, is marching back and forth like a ravenous lion waiting to jump into Israel. And the nation's foremost prophet, their man of God, has come up to say, hey, guess what? It's coming soon. And it's during that prediction that that prophet gives these promises. Meaning that, that before the coming destruction, there's already a promise of hope. God's promises in Isaiah's mind are as good as done. And just think about how this serves us right now. A COVID-19 winter is upon us. A divided nation. Personal freedoms being pushed to the circumference. And whether or not you agree with this or not, it doesn't really matter because it's true. <laughs> a relational, a spiritual, an emotional health crisis is upon us now. If you don't know that, you're not talking to enough people. It's in the midst of that darkness, the coming of Christ speaks light. Here's what I want to ask you. In the middle of all of this, can you speak in the past tense of the present reality of God's future promises? Are His promises to you now as good as done? You can know this by your anxieties. You can know it by your fears. You can know it by the under-the-breath mumbling. You can know it by the grumbling. Alec Mortier wrote again something that I think helps us in this. The eye of faith looks at all of this, but affirms that, real though it is, it is not the real reality. As always, the people of God must decide what reading of their experiences they will live by. Are they to look at the darkness, the hopelessness, the dream shattered, and conclude that God has forgotten them? Or are they to recall His past mercies, to remember His present promises, and to make great affirmations 
of faith? Are you seeing the light in the midst of the darkness? Well, the beauty is Isaiah doesn't stop with the promise because he tells us why we can see the light in the midst of the darkness. You're going to notice something interesting. Isaiah does something funny in this text, and he does it differently than most prophetic writers and even most apostolic writers, is he shows us the effects of an event before he talks about the event. Normally, you'll see the event, and then you'll, talk, you'll hear the effects of the event. Not Isaiah. Verses 1 through 5 are the effects of verses 6 through 7. And what you're going to notice is the event is not an event. The event is a person. The moment is a person. The reason for verses 1 through 5 is a person, which is our second point. Who does hope look like? And you can see in verse 6, very clearly, hope looks like a child being born, a son being given. And notice the phrase, to us, for to us. A child is born. To us, a son is given. In other words, Isaiah is saying, listen, children of God, in the midst of the prophecy of darkness, to you, to you, God has given a child, a son. Hope looks like a child being. It's probably the most quoted verse during Christmas time. Given in a prophecy of utter darkness, terrible gloom coming to speak hope in the midst of such darkness. This promise was given 700 years before it was fulfilled. The birth of this child, according to Isaiah, when you go back into the effects, is what turns gloom to glory and what flips sorrow to joy. This child is the one who breaks the oppressor and who shines light into darkness. And this, from the text, is no ordinary child. This child is a ruler. He's a king. Has a government given to him. And I want you to notice something. Look back with me at verse 4 for a moment and notice, notice this. It's a subtle thing, but I want you to be aware of it because I think it helps you in studying your Bibles. Notice what it says in verse 4. For the yoke of his burden... And the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken. In other words, on this oppressor's shoulder is a yoke, a rod. Something that's used for distress, pain, sorrow on the people that it's oppressing. But then notice that this child, this child is given a government laid where? Upon his shoulders. But yet notice, notice the characteristics of this child's government. Now you can know the characteristics of his government by looking at the attributes or the names by which he is called. He's the wonderful counselor, meaning his government is a wise government. It's perfectly omniscient. The word wonderful here implies supernatural, meaning his counsel is supernaturally wise. We could see into this, according to the kind intention of his holy will, that God counsels among himself in perfect wisdom. This leader, this child is the wonderful counsel, and his kingdom is a wise government, but it's also a strong, powerful government. Because he's the mighty God. The child is not just a human, but he's the mighty God. And his government is strong enough and powerful enough to help his people conquer any foe. But he's the everlasting father. Meaning his government is a compassionate government. Like a father caring for his children, providing for their very needs. I mean, Jesus said this, Which of you, being evil... Know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more does your father give to those who ask of him? And this government is a peaceful government. 
because he's the prince of peace. The implication here is that the prince reigns in peace with his people and his people live at peace with one another. Is there any, any better indication than 2 Corinthians 5 where we are ambassadors of Christ reconciling, calling the world to be at peace with God and calling Christians to be at peace with one another? And verse 7 tells us that it's an expansive, unlimited government, meaning there's no end to his rule. Perfect justice and perfect righteousness hold sway. And, and listen to this. When all is said and done and his kingdom is completed, there's not one pocket of rebellion in any corner of his kingdom. This is no ordinary child, friends. Hope looks like a child being born, a son who is given. Now let's just, for a moment... Notice, again, the present tense. For to us, a son is given. A child is given. 700 years later, Isaiah is seeing as if it is happening right now. And just for a moment, we have, some, we have an unusual vantage point as Christians. Isaiah, if you want to know how Isaiah saw this, you can look in the book of 1 Peter, and it tells us that the holy prophets before, they looked ahead to the day in faith that God would fulfill this very promise. Said so angels longed to look into this stuff. I mean, can't you imagine some of the knucklehead things that we do, and can't you imagine the angels going, hey, God, you see, pick these people? For real? Wow. Okay, I think we could do better, but you're good. You, you're, you're God. You can figure it out. Angels, prophets looking into these things. So we have an advantage point as a child of God. Isaiah's looking ahead. We are looking back. So let's just for a moment as Christians ask, how does Jesus fulfill what's in this text? How does he fulfill this? Let me just give you a few of them. Because there's a lot, but we'll just give you a few. Take verses 1 and 2. When this child comes, he will bring light to darkness. Well, in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus begins his ministry. Notice how the writer of Matthew wrote about Jesus' ministry. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. Those should be ring a bell to you. So that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled, the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, the way, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. Because remember, that was a border area between Israel and the Gentiles. The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and a shad shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. When this child comes, he will multiply the nation. Speaking of the nation of Israel, the nation of faith, the people of faith, Abraham's offspring, if you will, expanding it, growing it, which is a fulfillment of Genesis chapter 17, verse 5, when God spoke this to Abraham. No longer shall I call Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. Notice it didn't say a one singular nation. It said multitude of nations. And when Jesus comes to that Galilee, what is he doing? He's bringing the gospel. He's bringing the hope of being part of this nation called the people of God. That's why Jesus would say in John chapter 10, I have other sheep that are not of this fold, which is Israel. I will bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd, not distinctive flocks, one flock, one shepherd, which is a fulfillment of or something that Paul writes about in Romans 9 when he says, for not all who descended from Israel are Israel, and not all who are children of Abraham belong, are, are Abraham because of his, they're his offspring, but the children of the promise are counted as his offspring, thus fulfilling the multitude of nations coming. This child will be called the mighty God. And is there better, any better explanation of Jesus being the mighty God as Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, when Paul wrote, In him 
The whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. When the deity, the Son of God, is on, is on fight in your culture, in your city, you should be reminded of these words. No, he, he is the mighty God. He is God incarnate. This child, according to Isaiah, will sit on the throne of David and will establish that throne forever. It's a promise made to David, to Israel's greatest king, King David. In 2 Samuel, the Lord promised that would happen when Nathan prophesied these words to David. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who will come from your own body and I will establish his kingdom. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. And before Jesus was born, the angel Gabriel came and prophesied to Mary about what this king would look like. And here's what he said. He, speaking of Jesus, will be great. We call the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And for our last one, I want you to flip with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's too important not to look at 1 Corinthians 15 because for us, our oppressor isn't the Assyrians. It's not the Babylonians. Our our oppressor and all of mankind's oppressor is sin and death. Holding us in bondage underneath the power of our own sin. Looking the wrath of God in the face. And yet notice what the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 56. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, Jesus Christ coming living perfectly in your place, dying in our place, rising again from the dead, is the victory over the oppressor that's greater than the oppressiveness of of the Assyrians or the Babylonians. And Paul writes, Jesus fulfilled exactly what happened in Isaiah chapter 9. Jesus is the promised child. And Jesus is what hope looks like. In Jesus, all of Isaiah 9 has been fulfilled and will be eventually completely fulfilled. That's why, listen, we can say clearly because Christ has come, we of all people have hope in this world. That's why the complaining about the election, the frustrations with COVID, all the government overreach, all the stuff that we worry ourselves about, those things should pale in comparison to the hope that is found in the light of the glory of Christ. Because Christ has come, all those issues are secondary. You can see why in the middle of this dark season, and be honest, in the middle of any dark season, we need to be reminded of this truth. Because Christ has come, we can have hope in this world now. So let's finish with three quick things we can draw from the text. The first one is this, the child's come and so is his reign. The child has come and so has his reign Listen, again, we look back 2,000 years to this being started. Isaiah looked ahead 700 years and acted as if it was right in his present day. If Jesus is hope incarnate and Jesus is coming, brings his eternal reign, then listen, we're not waiting 700 years for this to get started. We're living in it now. Now. We're looking back, and Jesus is wise, strong, compassionate, peaceful reign has come and has started, and it will never end. It will always be increasing and moving forward. Listen, 
A pandemic doesn't stop it. A president you like or don't like doesn't stop it. Congress's halls cannot vote it out to existence. No communist dictator can stop the rule of the king of heaven. None. And this isn't just, you know, hey, Dave, that's really power of positive thinking. Thanks for giving me some positive things to think about. I'm so glad. This is, you know, you're such an optimist. I mean, man, half glass full. I really love half glass full, guys. So fun to be around. Thank you. That's not what this is about. This is based on the facts found in Holy Scripture. Notice the end of Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. This isn't based on, boy, I just really got to have some jolly thoughts to make these jolly thoughts. This is based on this fact. Darkness was heading in. Isaiah gives a prophetic vision of hope, and he says this to the people. In the middle of darkness, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do it. You know what that means? Nothing can stop it. This might have been the darkest year of your life, but that just does not stop the king of heaven from advancing his glorious rule. The son's coming, the son's kingdom, the son's reign, the son's extension of his rule, the son's wisdom, strength, compassion, and peace will never stop accomplishing all that God intends because God is the one who will see to it. Don't, don't, don't miss this. Please, don't be fooled. Don't be fooled by what you read and see as if all of a sudden God has turned his back on us. No, he has not and he never will. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Friends, Jesus has come, and you, of all people, have reason for hope. The second thing to draw to this is this text. This text kind of gives us this little, this little phrase. Hope equals as good as done. I'm amazed when I read Isaiah's prophecy here because he lives with such certainty that he saw the future in past present <clears throat> and you know living in this world it doesn't take you long to go very far to realize the sun's rule the sun's reign is not done yet I mean, you can't, you, you're going to go grab your takeout lunch get your bucket of chicken and come back here and have church you know, family meeting, and you're going to engage somebody and realize the Son of God's rule has not come here yet completely. You're going to go to the jo- go to Java Run and get your coffee cup, and you're going to realize in your own heart it's not completed yet. But here's the: is that keeping you from seeing the future completion? of what God has promised, and living as if that's a present reality? Is that the greater reality to you? Is it shocking to you that God, the sovereign God of the universe, has allowed for and is utilizing a global pandemic to accomplish everything he intended to do in the end. Are God's promises to you as good as done in your present reality? This text shows us that. Hope equals as good as done. It shows us a promise given 700 years prior being fulfilled, and it reminds us that all of God's promises will be fulfilled. They'll always be fulfilled. Why? Because the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. It's dependent on the character of God. And God's character is always perfectly, perfectly faithful. He will never fail in one iota of His promise. Don't miss the hope of Christmas declaring to you 
Hope means as good as done. The last thing is that doesn't this text show us that darkness cannot overcome? I mean, it really does. I mean, middle of, I mean, in the middle of the Assyrians, I mean, when you read the story, the history, the Israelites are looking over the border and they see these just multitude of multitudes and they are in they are in such fear they're not eating there's a famine that is just taking over their cities and they're terrified in the middle of that Isaiah gives this word of hope <laughs> when I read this text I I, I John 1 rings out in my mind. Here's what John wrote about the coming of Christ. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus has come into the world. The Word became flesh. God incarnate, the light. And the darkness cannot, has not, never will overcome that light. So friends, listen. The dark days of winter, the shortest days of the year, the cold and the rain that keep us inside, they cannot overcome the glory of Christ. They can't. And these dark days of COVID, governmental lockdowns, personal liberty restrictions, economies on a teeter-totter, racial divides, justice being trampled, will not overcome the rule and the hope of the Son of God. Your King has come. His kingdom will not fail. His promises are as good as done, and Jesus indeed is the hope of Christmas. Because Christ has come, we of all people have reason for hope. Let's pray. Father, in these, <clears throat> in these days, you, you know the hearts of each of us. You, you know our thoughts right now before we're thinking them. You know our needs before we even ask. You know the discouraged heart. You know the downcast heart. You know the isolated heart. You know the one that feels the weight of this darkness m- way more than I do or any of us in the room. You know each You know the anxieties over the economy. You know the fears of of the latest election for some, and you know the hopes of that election for some. Yet, Father, I, I pray that we would have a foundational hope that is built on something other and what we see with our human eyes. So would you do business with each of us right where we are right now? And church, just take a moment to thank God for Jesus' coming for you. To thank God that you're a child of God, you're a son and a daughter of the King. To thank God that you're not under the the reign of an oppressive, mean-spirited tyrant. You are living every day of your saved life under the wise, powerful, compassionate, peaceful, ever-increasing, kingdom of God ruled over by the wonderful counselor mighty God 
everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And thank Him that there is not one moment of your life that He has abandoned you or walked away from you. And that because Christ has come, your eternal hope is secure. Comfort, comfort your people, Lord. Lift up our eyes to the hills. Where does our hope come from, our help come from? It comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Why so downcast, O my soul? Put your hope in God. Father, rid us of hope of riches and hope of health and hope of a peaceful reign in our world and let us look beyond those things to see true hope, lasting hope. And then lastly, Father, would you, would you help your people see that you have providentially put us in this time, in this place, to represent you in a world that needs to see the reality of our hope. And thank you, Father, that you are at work and you will do everything your hand intends to do according to the kind and perfect wisdom of your holy and righteous will. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.